just an honor to be with you this morning. Today we want to uh, celebrate our seniors. Can we say, whoa, whoa? And everybody did it but them. They're so cool. <laughs> They're just so too cool for school, you know? No, um, we, we are glad to have them with us today and want to honor them. Uh, about 18 years ago, I... Um, me and another friend of mine, we were both uh, what we call an evangelist, which sort of meant traveling preachers, and uh, maybe you're familiar with that phrase or not, and I was about 19 years old, uh, I think that's right, that's close, don't do the math because I might have done it wrong, but anyway, um, so anyway, I, I was a traveling preacher, and uh, me and uh, my good friend, we traveled together sometimes, and uh, we had gotten on this real big <laughs> kick that we were going to go and find God, you know. And uh, so we had a mutual friend of ours who had a, actually a, a, a campsite with a camper on it in LJ in the mountains, and uh, the mountain of LJ. Can you call that mountains? Anybody know? Okay, I'm going to call it the mountains. Great. All right, good. Thank you. <laughs> so we was in the mountains of LJ. Um, uh, but anyway, we were there, and uh, we were headed there anyway, and uh, we were going to find God, and, which is kind of remarkable to me now that I think about it because we were both traveling preachers who needed to find God. It's like, maybe we should have already found him, you know what I mean? Like, before we started out on this venture, but, uh, but we were, that, that's, that's what we wanted to do. And we were going to go up there and fast for uh, 40 days and 40 nights and seek God. You know, that's where we were headed. And we told all the family, you know, listen, if, if you don't hear from us from 40 days, you'll know what's going on. We found God, right? We found him, and that's where we're going to be. And, uh, and so don't worry about us, and we'll be all right, and told anybody that we loved and, you know, might care about us and might wonder where we're at. And, um, and so we head up to LJ. We're going to the mountains, and we're going to go and find God, you know, because he wasn't where we was at, apparently. Uh, that's, that's my thinking on it these days. So, so anyway, we get up to uh, LJ, and as we get closer, I had planned to go in there, and I was going to just fast juice, you know, like do juices and, you know, maybe some milk. I don't know, what, whatever liquid I had to drink to survive, you know what I mean? And my buddy's like, I ain't doing no juices, I'm doing water. I'm like, well, you do what if you want to, but it's going to be hard me drinking my juice in front of you. <laughs> you know, and he's like, I mean, he just, I mean, so adamant. I'm doing nothing but water. And well, before it was over with, the peer pressure of his righteousness, okay, uh, worked on me, and I said, well, okay, I'm going to do water too, <laughs> you know. And uh, so here we go, lock ourselves in this, uh, uh, it's not God forsaken, it's a beautiful place, but we, we go to lock ourselves in this area for 40 days without any communication with people, just each other, and we're going to fast and pray and seek the Lord on water, okay. Um, so first day, I didn't realize that when he said fasting for 40 days, it would be sleeping for 40 days, <laughs> And so, and when he sleeps, it's not like, uh, you know, some quiet thing. It's a snoring grizzly bear sitting on the other end of the, the, the camper. And so, for the first night, snored all night long, pulling the paint off the walls. And um, I woke up the next day, I, you know, very little sleep, massive headache, you know, because, uh, well, that, that was the first night I had a headache. I had a headache as the day went into the first day. He slept most of the day. So I'm sitting here staring at myself. I got a headache. I'm trying to survive it. And all the while, I'm trying to find, you know who? God, right? He's lost. He don't know where he's at. <laughs> so, um, so after the first day, I mean, you know, massive headache. I go to bed that night. He slept all day. I mean, he was maybe conscious 15, 20 minutes out of the, 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 the whole time. And, uh, and so I'm thinking this is going to be easy for him because he'll wake up in 40 days and need a bath. And I'll have, I don't know where I'll be at this point. So, um, so the next day comes on and, and I wake up, you know, and there he is still sleeping. I can't really get him up to do anything and, you know, like go for a walk or something. So I'm like, I got to get out of this camper. I, I just have to because my head's killing me. And, you know, you know, I'm talking about that. If you ever try to fast a little bit, you ever get that, anybody else get that headache or whatever? And you think, my God, what am I doing? Why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> that whole prayer comes out. But anyway, I've got that kind of headache. And so I'm just dragging myself outside into the light. And, um, and I, there's a little mountain right behind it, the way the camper was set up. And it's shot, you know, straight up, pretty steep. And um, so I thought to myself, God's not in this camper. I've got to get higher, <laughs> you know. Amazing how we think sometimes. So I'm going to go higher and find God. So I start up the mountain. And, um, you know, it's maybe 200 yards where, you know, to the top, what I think would be the top. And I get about halfway, and I'm so weak by a day of not eating, which is hilarious, right? 
I'm just like, I mean, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm about to pass out. I feel like I'm going to die, you know. And so I did make it to the top where God was, right? So in my mind, I'm failing. I'm failing miserably. And I, I, I want to go home. And I just sit down. I found this old stump. I actually fell onto it and just got there. And as I'm sitting there, I'm praying, God, Please, just have mercy on me. I mean, just have mercy. I, I didn't want to pray, God, take me home because I'd made a deal. You know, I was going to stay there until I find him. That's what I told everybody. And all I could think about was I wanted to run home. But if I went home, I'd have to, you know, hear everybody say, what happened in 40 days, you know? And so I sit there and I pray. I'm like, God, ah. I, I get done with that. I finally get enough strength, uh, strength where... Honestly, I just remember, I mean, you know, I'm sort of whiting out. Everything's kind of coming and going, you know, and I finally get enough strength. And again, it's like a day and a half into this thing. So I, I, I get down the mountain. When I get down the mountain, I come up to our camper, and the, the power panel for the camper is on fire. No, it wasn't on my. I was like, yes. I mean, there's flames boiling, just boiling out of this fire, this box, this panel. I'm like, so I, I run. I'm like, hey, man, we got to get this fire out. And we get the fire. Well, when the fire's out, we don't have any power. There's no power. So I'm like, thank you, God. I'm going home. And I got a reason, right? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today is, you know, sometimes we, in our mind, if we're not careful, God's in some geographical location when it's really not about that. It's about the posture of your heart, and God's right here with us right now. Do you believe that? Now, I made a decision when, uh, uh, in January that I was going to, Kelly and I were, were going to throw our name in the hat and be the interim youth pastor for a while, and, uh, and, you know, we've actually committed to another year, and so we're excited about that. And the only reason I'm doing that is I do feel called to do it. And I've actually begun to like some of your children, which is pretty cool, you know. <laughs> I realize some of you struggle with liking them, so I can struggle with it too. I mean, um, no, but we, we really are connecting with them, enjoying them. And, and I made this statement. I was like, I'm going to know these seniors. When, I mean, when May 18th comes, we, we had it on the calendar. This is graduation day. Like, I'm going to know who they are. And I, when I give them their little gift, and I say, I'm like, I love you. I was going to be able to do that. Okay, but that didn't happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, what I soon found out was, uh, man, these guys are busy. Man, they're busy, you know. They're busy with academics and busy with sports and trying to keep up with, you know, what all's going on in school. And they've got four months until they graduate and they're about to head to college. And, you know, all this life just running at them. And as I'm wrestling with this, you know, I'm, try I'm trying to get in the world. I realize that after 18 years of not needing me, they didn't need me for the last four months. And it's okay, fellas and, and ladies. I'm not, I'm not hurt, okay? I'm, not, I'm looking over here because where most of them are. I'm not, I'm not offended, okay? <laughs> but I realized that they're busy. And then I was, I was reminded, I was busy at that age. But you know what? I'm still busy. <laughs> Anybody else still busy? It doesn't slow down. It doesn't change. It doesn't get any less. And, and I just, I look back in my life and I look behind me and I'm like, man, what a blur. I mean, I woke up one day and I got, I got wrinkles and, you know, it's, it's starting to happen. I'm starting to look, you know, people, uh, just a few years ago in college, I remember I was talking, I was hanging out, you know, I was being cool. I'm like, what's up? And she's, and this girl come up and was talking, hey, y'all, you know, about homework. Yes, sir. <laughs> I got on the same clothes. I mean, isn't it cool? <laughs> There's no sir here, you know, but it's happening. Life, you know, got married, got babies, and, you know, now we got another baby, and I'm, you know, 12 years apart from the first one, and uh, I feel like a granddaddy. That's what I feel like. And uh, I'm just telling you, I mean, the little fella's getting spoiled like a grandbaby would. And I'm like, it's different. I mean, it's just different than where I was at. But life is just happening. It's so fast. It's easy to get distracted and get focused on the wrong thing. And what I want to challenge you to today, and I want to challenge our students to today, is listen, uh, if you don't do anything in life, if you just remember, if I could have went back to the 18-year-old me, I'd slap myself around a little bit and say, look, don't ever forget to take the time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Don't. Don't ever forget to take the time. And I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about singing songs. I'm not talking about reading your Bible. I'm not talking about praying and all of that other stuff. I'm talking about taking the time to sit at the feet of Jesus. 
and listen for a little while. There's a song that I heard uh, years ago, and every time I come across this thought, I'm reminded of it. And the song said, I'm, I'm so busy for the kingdom that I've got no time for the king. Right? Wouldn't that be a sad day? As I think about the ten lepers, they had that opportunity. They had an opportunity to come back and sit at the feet of Jesus, to be with him. All right? How many people got that chance? Not many, because everywhere he went, there were thousands around him. He was, you know, there was always a crowd of people. And so unless you were inside, you didn't really get that personal time with them. But ten outcasts who were outside the city, they had an opportunity one day to come back and sit at his feet, and only one of them did. Turn with, if you would, to John. Go ahead. Let me pull up my notes here. Bill Graham in his book, let me, hold on just a second now. Turn with me to John real quick. Not John, Luke. That's, that's why I was messing up. Luke chapter 10. Chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now, I've, I've had the opportunity to go to the Holy Land several times now, and I think I'm, I'm about to embark on my fourth trip and never really dreamed that I'd get to go one time, much less uh, three more. And so I feel honored and blessed to do that. And, um, but one of the, the, probably the most amazing gifts that I've encountered uh, over in the Holy Land is the gift of hospitality that is so strong and it, it exists among their people. And, um, and so it's more than, you know, uh, how you do or whatever. There's a really strong emphasis on serving. And so in Jesus' day, it would have been very customary, it would have been very official for when Jesus or a guest were to come into your house, that the ladies of the house would have worked very hard and diligent to make sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And so it's not just Martha saying to Jesus, hey, look, something's amiss here. Mary's at your feet when she should be working. It's the entire culture screaming at him right there in that moment saying something is amiss and something is wrong. And uh, Jesus replied to Martha and said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now imagine, you know, you're not in trouble for doing the wrong thing. You missed out because you were doing the right thing. You missed out because... You needed to clean up or you missed out because you needed to, you know, make some beds or get the table ready. And, you know, and somebody's got to do that. I mean, thank God for that. But, but the deal is there's an opportunity every once in a while. There's a moment, there's a chance to sit in his presence, to sit at his feet. And I, I want to tell you, I wished every day when I prayed was the same. I wish that I always encountered this, you know, magnificent time with God. But what I have learned over the years is that sometimes I have to be faithful to my prayer. I just have to be faithful to my reading. And it isn't always like this heavenly moment, you know. But there are moments when I feel like I'm being visited. I feel like there's something happening in my prayer time. And you know what I don't want to do? I don't want to change the channel. I've learned to be real still and real cautious and be like, God, I feel you and I know you're here and I don't want to leave. Well, there are moments in our lives that, uh, you know, and at that moment, you know, I got my yard out there. It needs to be mowed. I, you know, kids. I mean, it could be a, a host of things that I need to go and do. But the better part, the better part, the part that's going to change me, the part that's going to make it better is sitting at his feet and just enjoying that time. And it may, you know, I want to say it like this, a lot of times it's me saying nothing. It's just me listening, trying to listen to God. Another story, John chapter 12, it involves the same, uh, uh, same family. Jesus was friends with Lazarus. And, uh, and, and I tried to, I, you know, as I was reading in these two stories, I couldn't find out if it was uh, the same story with just a few more details, and sometimes that happens in the, in the Scripture, uh, or if this was two different scenarios. And with a few, few minor things, I think it uh, leans more to two different scenarios, which uh, makes it habitual 
But we're in John chapter 10. No, John chapter 12, my bad. Verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Say served. Here's Martha again serving while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. He said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but he was because he was a thief. Judas didn't say it because he cared. He was just simply a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to uh, help himself out uh, to what was put in it. Good old Judas, right? And Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should, say, she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. That's remarkable to me. I mean, he didn't rebuttal Judas and say, oh, no, 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 Judas, you're wrong. You got a wrong heart, wrong spirit, wrong attitude. I mean, he almost somewhat says what Judas is saying is true. Hey, that would have been a great choice. It would have been a great decision to take that perfume, sell it, and go do ministry with it, right? I mean, he didn't say that's a wrong idea. But he does reply and says, you know what? You'll always have the poor, but you don't always have me. The deal is this morning is in our lives, in our busy, busy, busy lives, I want to ask you the question, are you taking the time not to just read your Bible, I'm not, not to just pray, not to stop, but just say, Lord, I'm going to sit at your feet. There's so many distractions that come. The Bible says the fields are wide unto harvest, but the labors are few. You know what? The work never, ever stops, does it? It doesn't stop. I mean, we get texts, and now we get e you know, emails and texts and WhatsApps, and uh, you know, that's just uh, a few circles in life. And then we got you know, friends at work and friends at home and trying to do things at the house, and you got to keep mama happy and uh, loving on the babies. Anybody with me this morning? Does anybody here like to wash clothes? There was one woman here this morning in, in our early service, and uh, she, I'm so proud that she's living with me. <laughs> it's Kelly's granny. She's been, she's been with us for several months now, and uh, she actually grew up here in uh, Cockwood County, and uh, so she's come back to stay with us. But I tell you, if these pants would actually accidentally fall off into the floor, it'd be about an hour before they were folded and sitting in my drawer. Can I say, whoa, whoa? <laughs> in the night, I lean over and I tell Kelly, I said, don't let that detergent run out, whatever you do. <laughs> Baby, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, but washing clothes, it's like you can wash a load, and then five minutes later, there's a load. It's like, where did you come from? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like... It never, ever stops. So, I mean, you can say, hey, you know, when I get the clothes washed, I'm going to go spend some time with God. You ain't never going to do it. Hey, when I get this straight, when I get this happening, when I, you know, I just got to fix this. No, you got to just stop it and say, right now in this moment, I hear him calling, so I'm going to go and I'm just going to sit for just a moment at the feet of Jesus. Billy Graham in his book, The Holy Spirit Activating God's Power in Your Life, shared this story and said an Eskimo fisherman came to town every Saturday afternoon. He was always brought his two dogs with him. One was a calm dog and the other one was very vicious. He had taught them to fight on command. And every Saturday afternoon in the town square, the people would gather and these two dogs would fight and the fishermen would take bets. On one Saturday, the vicious dog would win. And then another Saturday, the calm dog would win. But the fisherman always won. <laughs> His friends began to ask him how he did it. And he said, I starve the one and feed the other. And the one I feed always wins because he is stronger. Does that sound familiar to anybody? 
I had this will in me to do good. I want to do what's right. I want to make Jesus my utmost priority. I want to be the example that he's called me to be. But then there's this other guy that I wrestle with. And you know what he's like, man, just live life for you. No need to care about anybody. No need to be sacrificial. No need to give up your belongings. I mean, hold on to it. And so I find this wrestling inside of me. Anybody else? Which one's going to win? The one you feed. The one you feed. And so I want to give you a couple tips uh, to, to helping Stay at the feet of Jesus. And I, I want to make sure I'm clear with this because a lot of these actions could be done, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're in his presence or you're there waiting on him, okay? Uh, but one of the, the first tip I want to give you is uh, something that's one of my favorite things. I mean, I absolutely love it. Just music. <laughs> right? Music in general. It's so easy. I mean, easy to take your car now and just set it up to where and you're listening to uplifting music rather than uh, something that's distracting. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I like it all. All right? I listen to a little bit of all. When I'm at the gym, I want, I want something to pump me up and get me going, you know. And um, I, I like to dance a little bit, you know. And, right? Well, the other night, uh, me and my family had went out, and um, they were being such angels to me. And no, <laughs> my oldest two were in the back, like, nah, nah, rah, 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 you know. And Branson's in his seat. He's like, rah, you know. And I'm thinking... <laughs> What have I done? And uh, really, me and Kelly weren't really on the same page, you know what I'm saying? And um, she, she was kind of at me, and I said, you know what? I said, y'all hold up right now. Everybody stop. I want you to listen to something. And so I took a few seconds, and I'm like, here, are you ready? And I said, listen to this. Well, you can tell everybody. Yeah, you can tell everybody. Go ahead and tell everybody. I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. Yes, I am, yes, I am, yes, I am. I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. Say, woo! <laughs> I said, everybody in this truck, now you be quiet and listen. Y'all need to know something. And I matched that for them. And they're all like, huh? My boy's like, huh? What's that mean? Later on, Kelly's like, baby, what do you mean by you're the man? I said, baby, anywhere you want to take it. <laughs> anywhere you want to take it, I'm the man, all right? You know, that feels pretty good. You know, it feels good. It feels right. You know, I'm standing up to myself. Any y'all men, any men in the house? Don't be afraid. I know you're sitting by your wives. Don't be afraid. Don't be <laughs> You just tell you blame it on me. You say I did that you know, I was just with the crowd. You know what I mean? I didn't mean it, baby. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go wash clothes. <laughs> I'll be in here washing clothes. <laughs> yeah, some manpower, right? So, you know that that does me good. And so I, I heard that, and man, that stuck with me. I'm like, it was so funny how that all came out. And um, and and and, but it doesn't do for me. It doesn't do for me what. Uh, listen to one of my favorite worship leaders of all time, all right? I love uh, to sit, uh, Michael W. Smith can lead me to heaven a lot of times. But it doesn't do for me, that song doesn't do for me what, what hearing him sing, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. <coughs> And like a flood, his mercy reigns, right? Unending love, oh, amazing grace, right? When I hear that song, something happens, and then maybe, maybe, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives. All my fear is gone because I know He holds the future, right? And life is worth the living just because He lives. There's something different. 
It's different when I cut my radio and I've got Michael W. Smith changing the atmosphere of my life in a moment. And listen, I want to tell you, it's just too easy. It's too easy. It's not one of those things like, well, man, that's just difficult. Dude. No, it's easy. It's easy and it pushes you. You know what it pushes you? To sit at the feet of Jesus. Another thing I want to share with you is, and I think it's probably one of the most underutilized uh, tools of the church today. And it's obvious. It's not a big secret. And that's the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is strong. It's powerful. It's sharp. It molds us. It makes us. And, and you know, what I heard a lot of times when somebody, you know, there's some people, they are theologians, and, man, they just read and stuff. I mean, read and go and go and go. And I look at their gift, and I think, whoa, what an amazing gift. And I think a lot of people walk under condemnation because they're not reading at that level or studying at that level. But listen, if I could just get you to commit to reading one verse a day, one verse a day, if you took one verse a day for the next 365 days and implemented in your life, you would be a changed being. I want to share some promises that God gives us in His Bible, in the Word of God. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. That'd be pretty good to wake up to in the morning, wouldn't it? Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine. 28, 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isaiah 40, verse 29. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will fail and become weak and tired. And young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord and find new, will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I'm telling you, the Word of God, just in small doses, has the power to transform your life and your opportunities with God. The third thing I want to share with you, and it's probably even more obvious than the rest of them, it's just one last one I want to share, is prayer. What is prayer? And I know if I would have passed the mic and said, hey, let's all pray, some of you might go, huh? <laughs> Don't ask me to pray. I don't want to pray out loud or whatever. I know prayer can be an intimidating thing, but prayer, to me, this is, in its simplicity, is a conversation between you and just God. It's you and God. Sometimes it's very intense. Sometimes it's very loud for me. Sometimes it's very quiet, but it is a prayer nonetheless. It's a conversation that I'm having with God. I like what um, um, Max, uh, not, uh, not Max Lucado, but Oswald Chambers says in my utmost for his highest. He talks about prayer and in the middle of one of his devotionals, and at the end, I just want to share what it says at the end. It says, to say that prayer changes things. Because that's what the Bible says. You know the Bible says that prayer changes things, okay? He said, to say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying prayer changes me, and then I change things. God has established things so that prayer on the basis of redemption changes the way a person looks at things. Prayer is not a matter of changing things externally, but one of working miracle in a person's inner nature. What a powerful thought to think that I'm not praying to make something happen out there. I'm praying so that I get to know God. I get to learn God. And then something begins to transform on the inside. A lot of times we look at our problems and our circumstances and, and you're going to face them. And I can say to all our graduating students today, life uh, has a lot of joys offered to you ahead. But obstacles are going to come because it's just a part of living. Every single time an obstacle, obstacle comes, please don't forget to first just say, you know what, I'm going to go to my Jesus. I'm going to go to my God and just say, you know what, I'm going to pray just for a minute and get a fresh perspective. I'm going to let him change the way I'm looking at this. And I'm going to say, when I get done, I'm going to say some different things. I'm not going to say what I would normally say. You know, when we look at troubles by ourselves, it's like, I can't do it. It'll never happen. It's just bad. It's just this. But when God gets done with us, it's like, hey, we're overcomers. We're going to make it. We can do this. Right? Amen? So listen, I'm going to close this way, and I'm going to ask you to just bear a minute with us. Um, uh, we do want to celebrate our seniors. And uh, first, a lot of you, you may not know who they are. So what we'd like to do is introduce them to you uh, through this video. And then after that, I'll give you a few more instructions, okay? Watch this with us.
Kirby Elkin Cooper, son of Norris and Pam Cooper, has been a member of the band 6th through 9th grade, an FFA member for 7 years, a Skills USA member for 4 years, and received a top award from Math 4 student, and is a certified construction worker with a technical certificate from Moultrie Technical College, received a Skills USA Carpentry Proficiency Assessment Certificate, and is a Merit graduate. He is a member at Heritage Church, Heritage Youth, part of the media and technical team, a VBS volunteer, and a volunteer firefighter at Culbertson Volunteer Fire Department for three years. He plans to go to work full-time with Water Graphic Incorporated. Caleb Christian DeMont, son of Scott and Lisa DeMont, has been a member of the FFA Club, the Key Club, Black and Gold, and went on a mission trip to Jamaica last summer. He loves to fish and plans to go on a mission trip this summer to Honduras. He also plans to attend Georgia State in the fall. Maria Galagos, daughter of John and Amherst Walls, is involved in Heritage Youth and their drama team, as well as in discipleship and spiritual retreats. Maria received the Huntley Foundation Scholarship and plans to attend Moultrie Technical College for an early childhood degree and then transfer to ABAC to pursue a degree in education. Rodrigo Medina Solorio, son of Ramiro Medina and Victoria Solorio, has enrolled in various honor and AP courses, participated in Packer Idol, enjoys playing guitar and piano in his spare time, and has been a part of and led the Spanish ministry worship. He has attended Snowbird Camp as well. He wants to finish his core classes nearby and eventually transfer to Savannah College of Art and Design to study sound design. Megan Kayla Merritt, daughter of Mel and Patty Weir, and granddaughter of Bobby and Judy Merritt, has been a member of the FCA, PFS, Special Olympics Gymnastics Partner, Y Club Chaplain, and the Peer Leadership. She was part of the 2014 Senior Homecoming Court and was voted by her peers to be an unsung hero. She was also a member of the 2014 GHSA Gymnastics All-State Team and was a Y Nationals All-American Gymnast from 2009 to 2013. She is a Merritt Scholar graduate. At Heritage, she has been a member of Heritage Youth, Salt Leader, Children's Church Leader, VBS Leader, Youth Prayer Chapel Leader, and a Storehouse Volunteer, as well as being active in missions. She plans to attend Thomas University and major in education with a concentration in English and language arts. She would also like to continue to take part in missions. Megan Smith, daughter of David and Ann Smith, and granddaughter of Patricia McCoy and Bo Rosencrantz, competes with the National Barrel Horse Association and also runs with several saddle clubs, including Deep Dixie Association, Mitchell County Saddle Club, Syrup City Saddle Club, and Justimir Farms Buckle Series. She began riding horses when she volunteered with Cockwood County Special Olympics Equestrian Team at the age of eight. Megan is currently the Georgia State Representative for the Special Olympics of North America for the Project Unify program. She has volunteered at a camp for children with intellectual and physical disabilities for the past four years. Megan is a member of the Cockwood County FFA and will be attending a national convention in October to compete at the National Job Interview Career Development Event. She is a Merit graduate, and after graduation, Megan plans to attend Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in Tipton, Georgia. Isandri Wright, daughter of Misty Bridges, is a member of the Cockwood County Acapella Choir. At Heritage, she attended Heritage Youth and participated in the Dive and Purity Retreats. She plans on attending Savannah State University. Why don't you give it up for our grads this morning, huh? We actually, uh, we had six more in the early service, and um, so we celebrated with them this morning. And here's how I'd like for you to respond today, if you could. Uh, we uh, it's sort of become a tradition for us to uh, bless our seniors and pray over them and, and in this service and send them out. And so I'm going to ask them to come down here and split up here at the altars if your family wants to come up with them and love on them. We've given them a journal. Uh, if you maybe got a scripture you'd like to write in there, a verse or something, you know, feel free to do that as well. And just worship with us. Uh, for those who maybe... Uh, maybe are not associated with the seniors, we just want to invite you to continue to worship with us, pray with us. Uh, essentially, we are dismissed. I'm going to ask you, though, as you go, please don't open, leave the doors open. Just go out quietly so we can have the prayer time with the seniors, all right? Bless you guys, and uh, thank you so much. Come on down, guys. Come on. Yeah. Exactly how 